Greetings, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you for finding the time to join us today from all corners of the world. We just, I just got a note that we have even uh, attendees from South Korea. Um, I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Caucasus edition, which is the journal that is hosting today's event. Uh, and we have two co-moderators. I am Philip Gamagelian, uh, one of your co-moderators, also an editor at Caucasus edition and an assistant professor at the Koch School of Peace Studies at the University of San Diego. I'm joined today by my good friend and colleague, Sebel Huseyneva, also uh, a, a, an editor at Caucasus Edition, uh, and who is also uh, a researcher at the Center for Independent Social Research in Berlin. We also have two distinguished speakers today uh, who I'm sure have no need for introduction for anyone who knows our region. Having said that protocol is protocol, so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gerard Liparitian, uh, a professor emeritus of history at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Oh, sorry, Mr. Zawar Z- Shiriev, uh, who is an analyst, a South Caucasus analyst at the International Crisis Group. Uh, today's, the, to- the topic of today's seminar uh, are the failures and the prospects uh, of the Nagorno-Karabakh peace process. And we hope it will be only the first in a series of monthly webinars that we organize uh, on the topic of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. The second webinar is already planned for uh, February 16, which is also Tuesday around the same time. And we will post a link uh, to it at some point uh, in the chat window. Uh, Turning to the format of the conversation, uh, we are hoping to have this as an interactive discussion between the co-hosts and the speakers. And the first half uh, of about 90 minute webinar, I will be devoted to a discussion uh, on the two main topics uh, of today, uh, which are the failures and the prospects of the Nagorno-Karabakh peace process, as well as the third topic, which is um, the current developments and the risks that they contain. The second half uh, of the seminar is uh, devoted to a Q&A session where we hope to involve our audience. And you can find the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. So feel free to post there any questions you might have. Uh, If you cannot find the Q&A button, you also can uh, post your comments or questions uh, in the uh, chat window. And it's visible only to the moderators and to the panelists. It's not visible to the other audience members. You can choose to post your questions in your own name or uh, anonymously. Uh, Having said that, I need to acknowledge that we have over 700 RSVPs and over 500 people already watching, which means that we likely will not be able to get through every single question. So what we will be trying to do is to group the questions into topics uh, for discussion. And in the second half of the conversation, we will try to address three or four topics that you raise in your uh, questions. And if we still don't get to your question, we promise that we will read through them and um, try to compile new uh, set of topics for the discussions down the road in March, April, and the further seminars. So without further ado, I'll pass the word here to Sebel Hussein about to start us off. Sebel. We cannot hear you. Uh, it's a very, we can hear you are there, but we cannot hear what you're saying. Can you get the volume up or get closer? Is it it's better? It's good now. Yeah, good now. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Phil, for the introduction. Uh, dear colleagues, guests, thank you all for joining us on this uh, Tuesday evening or morning, depending on the time zone. Um, as Phil already mentioned, uh, we start a new series of webinars in the completely new context. Um, It's obvious that the last war and its results um, have brought about new realities to the region. There are many new questions and challenges, and we are not going to describe the events of the last months, but in order to move forward, we must, in any case, understand the reasons behind the failure of the long-lasting negotiation process. 
there have been different stages, moments, situations during uh, this process. At some point, the negotiators themselves have been changed. I would like to start with a question to Professor Liparidian. As a long time observer and a negotiator himself, why did negotiations fail? This is, of course, a very broad question, and we have to narrow the topic down. Um, just yesterday, we could observe how the sides see the specifics of the negotiation process differently. During the trilateral meeting in Moscow, neither President Aliyev nor Putin mentioned the OSCE Minsk group, uh, while uh, Prime Minister Pashinyan stressed that he considered the format of the Minsk group to be important. Um, this institution of co-chairs was criticized before, during, and after the war. Particularly in Azerbaijan, in the post-war months, uh, the Minsk group had been heavily criticized for its inefficiency and inability to deal with the conflict. In your opinion, how effective was the activity of the Minsk group in negotiation process for the last years and whether they had any resources and possibilities to really influence the conflict parties to achieve a compromise. Um, Mr. Uh, Professor Liberidian, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, uh, Ms. Sainova. Uh, as you, uh, first, thank you for organizing this event. Uh, there's too many changes occurring too fast <clears throat> and it's important to catch up although sometimes we're not in a position to really understand what is the meaning of what we know is happening. And certainly difficulties uh, seeing the future. Uh, there are many reasons for the failure um, of negotiations. Uh, I'll mention a few first and then <clears throat> answer the specific question asked by uh, Mrs. Sainova. Uh, this is not, has not been a conflict of just interests, which are easier to resolve. This has been a conflict in which the sides have invested their history, their culture, their identity. Uh, a conflict that is too much part of domestic developments on both sides. Uh, specifically, one can uh, remember that in both sides, uh, staying in power meant taking maximalist, ex extremely nationalist positions using that kind of discourse. And then uh, people accepting that kind of discourse and then uh, having difficulty accepting compromises. Uh, there was not much trust between the parties. Uh, very importantly, the parties did not formulate minimum positions as opposed to their maximum positions. The minimum not being fixed, that meant that uh, they were not sure what to accept. The two sides are resolving different problems. For Azerbaijan, it's a matter of territory uh, and people are not that important on it. Uh, for Armenia, it is people uh, on their historic territory. Um, it is possible to argue uh, that um, for both sides, war was uh, what they took their chances with for different reasons and with different logics. So while negotiating, they always had in mind that, you know, uh, maybe this will be resolved by another war. And in fact, that's what happened. Now, as to the specific uh, question uh, on the MIS group, I think uh, that the MIS group in fact was ineffective. Not that they did not have resources. These were very important countries, Russia, US, France, uh, and indirectly France, you know, doing work on behalf of Europe, although not formally. Uh, these are countries with huge resources, um, military, diplomatic, economic, and uh, three members of the US, uh, UN Security Council. The problem, was not that they did not have resources. The problem was that although all three agreed on the fundamentals of the solution, which is rare, uh, all three said that 
Karapah could not be independent. All three said that the uh, occupied territories would have to be returned. Despite this, they did not look at the Garapakh conflict just as a conflict of that particular uh, definition. They looked at it as part of the issue of the region where different parties, different mediators have different interests and at some point conflicting interests. As a result of which I think the three uh, countries uh, did not use their resources. That is, they did not do a Dayton they did not uh, bring the sides together and compel them to accept the solution because each side thought that whoever put pressure on one side, uh, the other side would win. So uh, this was the reason I think it became really very ineffective. And I, I've said before uh, for many years that what would have been different if instead of France, US and Russia, we had Zimbabwe, uh, Sierra Leone and uh, Canada doing it. Or if the proposals that came, came from a think tank in, uh, in Azerbaijan, in Armenia, in France, or in, in uh, South America. That is, if you do not use the, your resources, that means you are no different from others. And that misses the opportunity. So I think um, uh, one way that could have been resolved and at some point in my work, I thought we might have gotten to the point where we resolved about 80% of the issues, 85%. And then uh, the three presidents of the three countries, France, US, and Russia, could bring the leaders together and kind of put them in the room and say, you agree or else. And that we never got to that. No one wanted to do that. So in my view, this is basically the reason, uh, the various reasons, but it, as far as the international mediation is concerned, uh, it is very clear that the, although formally even Russia says that yes, the OSC Minsk group is somehow involved, uh, my understanding from uh, that involvement as far as Russia is concerned is uh, that uh, France and the US will uh, work to provide assistance to Russia, humanitarian assistance, rebuilding assistance, in order for Russia to do what it wants to do, but not to be involved. In the first November 9 agreement, you will remember that uh, they said there was no time, it was a matter of hours. But this one has been planned, so why weren't they, why weren't the French and the Americans present? It's basically that uh, France is out. Uh, and I'll explain later why. And the US is, uh, has really given up on the world. And not just because of Trump, but because in general, the US is withdrawing. So uh, Russia has found the right moment and it's going to drive the process, however um, uh, much the others may complain. So uh, I don't see much of a role for the other two coming in. Although Russia will want to keep it for, uh, in, uh, formally under OSCE, and then whatever agreement is reached, get the OSCE to approve it. Uh, Salil, we cannot hear you again. Um, and now, is it okay now? Yeah. Um, thank you, Professor, for, for the insight. Um, Let us imagine that uh, there were no uh, mediators. And um, I um, turn it over to Mr. Shaviev. Um, you, as uh, you were involved uh, with observing the conflict and uh, the peace process, what, uh, what you would add to the question, or uh, let us imagine that there were no mediators in the negotiation process. Would Armenia and Azerbaijan have had any chance of reaching a compromise and deal directly without any support of the mediators? And if so, why did it, uh, this not happen? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, the debate. I think I think this is a very retrospective question. I, I think uh, we have a different interpretation. If, if we say that whether 
uh, imagine that there were any mediators. I think I will look at a different layer to this question. So uh, the one example is that when the, the new Armenian government uh, came to power, I think uh, they start a direct communication between uh, them. So they open up communication channel. So they have a, a chance of uh, uh, rebuilding the, uh, the trust and also to, to move forward to the negotiations. So, uh, and uh, about uh, this the direct negotiation after so many years uh, uh, didn't bring any, any result, any positive result between the sides. Uh, but I think that uh, Dr. Lebardian is here. I think he, he was uh, one of the person who, who acted as a direct negotiation with Azerbaijani counterparts in the 90s, and it was very successful in, 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 in some issues, so especially uh, the regulation of the ceasefire and, and other related issues. So I think the, the direct channel would be uh, very uh, good for sides uh, to move forward. But uh, without mediators, I think it will be very uh, uh, not possible to, to have a very uh, negotiated settlements on uh, the, the conflict. So, but uh, the coming to question about the Minsk group, I think, so we have a different expectation from Minsk group, both of Zobitian and Armenia. I mean, why there is a direct criticism to the Minsk group because uh, uh, Minsk group, at least from Azerbaijan perception is that acted as, as a messenger, not as a mediators. So I think the messenger means that uh, they delivered the message of Baku to Yerevan and, uh, and also uh, delivered Yerevan's message uh, on particular issues to Baku. So it was done, uh, so, but they, 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 they didn't bring any uh, new ideas to, to the negotiation table. So the last time uh, they did this in the, the, when they drafted this, the model principles in 2007 and 2009. Uh, so, First of all, I think the impression, expectation from Minsk group uh, was different. So, but they acted uh, the different there. And, and the second issue is that uh, there was a perception, and it's not only the perception is very uh, we see on the Minsk group course here. So, in, in general, that everyone see that uh, the war will be mutually destructive and more tragic than the the war in 90s, and so that's why. This is a deterrent against any war for both sides. So uh, they became sure that uh, either there will be not be uh, a war between the sides because that is the deterrence factor. The second is that the maximum the war could have uh, happened uh, in the similar scale of the April escalation. Uh, so the, no more than four days or the five days, and then no outside the powers, especially Russia, will not uh, will not. Uh, give a chance of uh, continuation of the war. So this, the fact is actually also created the perception that, uh, so they can continue this negotiation over the more years. Uh, so, but also there's a misperception about the misgroup courses. Sometimes we saw the misgroup courses as an arbiter, not a mediators. So they will decide uh, on behalf of Azerbaijan and Armenia. This is the wrong perception. I think uh, this is not a, uh, you cannot find a single similar case in the conflict resolution process that uh, the mediator is, is deciding anything on behalf of the, the conflict parties. Uh, but uh, also I would like to add one more one more one more thing that um, that Dr. Libardian said. I appreciate his approach in, in many issues, but I think uh, for Azerbaijan Nagorno-Karabakh or let's say the old territories that uh, that controlled by Armenian troops uh, is not uh, merely a a total issue. It was also also a uh, human issue, humanitarian issue, and also human factor played a, a great role because of this. Uh, the IDPs, uh, the forced to flee in 19s, and uh, they were uh, at least a 10% of also within the overall population uh, in, in 2000. So that's why uh, their role in society, their demand also played an important role. So this is one of the misperception. Uh, at least I see in the Western countries that uh, the they looked at uh, there is no demand about the return of the IDP, so it was forgotten after 25 years. There is no chance they will. Uh, they have already set, settled. So this was the misperception. Uh, the, I, I will add more, but this is uh, I think not a topic of our discussion here. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Sharif. So um, one can say. Uh, that both sides uh, were mutually exclusive 
with very different interpretations of the possible conditions for compromise and peace. And each side believed that the mediators should support only one side and force the other to come to an agreement. Um, um, coming back to, to the yesterday meeting, um, uh, the position of the official Azerbaijan is as follows. The war is over, and so the conflict came to an end. Uh, and I turn it uh, to, to, uh, to uh, Phil. Um, over to you. What do you think about this and how this position is perceived in Armenia? Uh, thank you, Sevil. Thank you uh, for uh, very insightful answers uh, to the first question. Actually, coming to the question of the failures uh, themselves, if I also can my add a couple of words. Uh, it's a big topic, of course, and deserves a webinar on its own, perhaps. Uh, but if I uh, were to really single out one, uh, reason I would say that since 1994 ceasefire uh, we, uh, the, the governments negotiated officially uh, over Nagorno-Karabakh but uh, at the same time instead of preparing themselves their states and their populations for peace uh, they did everything to prepare the populations for the second war. Uh, these have been uh, the, the very heavily armed states uh, they have been per, on ca per capita basis uh, two of the most militarized states uh, in the world. Uh, and uh, the image of each other as mutual enemies uh, that have to be defeated rather than compromised with uh, was continually built upon. And my worry is that even after the second war uh, that just uh, ended two months ago, we might go back to the same cycle and continue the same rhetoric, continue uh, to escalating and preparing for a third and possibly much more destructive war, considering that the conflict is now regionalized. And whoever comes out um, as a beneficiary of that possible future third war, it will likely be neither Armenia nor Azerbaijan, uh, but third parties. And that is very much concerning to me. Uh, and that does yeah, bring us to the second question, uh, the second topic for discussion today. And since we started with uh, Professor Liparizian in the first round, uh, I'll start with uh, Mr. Shiriev in this one and turn to Azerbaijan. Uh, as Sevil mentioned, we can hear two rather contradictory messages coming from Baku. Uh, on the one hand, on a very high level, uh, you can hear that the war is over and the conflict is resolved. Uh, just yesterday, President Aliyev uh, brought this up exactly in, yeah, in similar wording uh, during the press conference that followed his meeting with President Putin and Prime Minister Pashinyan. Uh, on the, other hand, uh, you can hear rather hostile rhetoric coming again from the government and from government controlled media, uh, including uh, territorial claims to Arme Republic of Armenia itself, particularly Zangezur, um, and even more basic humanitarian issues are not resolved, such as the return of prisoners of war. And if the conflict is resolved, then why uh, yeah, is any side holding to uh, prisoners of war and not uh, returning them. And these are just two, three uh, particular issues I brought up, uh, but I want to turn to you and see what's your opinion, what's your thinking about the current developments and what risks do, do we have now? So. Thank you, Phil. I think uh, uh, for the, the first uh, one, uh, yes, uh, I think there is a uh, uh, rhetoric is that war is over. So right now that we, we should give a chance to, to the peace. At the same time, I say, yes, we saw the, some, uh, some written this approach, but this is uh, the problem is that uh, these are, uh, uh, these people are in the social media, but social media is not the actual society. So sometimes we are misinterpreting that they are actually reflecting their societal views on different issues. Uh, uh, but uh, if you respect to the international law and uh, law in general, I think uh, there shouldn't be any, any claim or historical claim or any, any other claim to Armenia's sovereign, sovereign territories. So I think this is this is a just position, I guess, uh, the Azerbaijani government. Uh, but at the same time, yes, we heard sometimes that uh, about this uh, historical lands. Uh, so based on the based on the context we can misinterpret uh, these things uh, differently my my approach is that yes uh, the approach uh, right now the approach is that the war is over 
So we should accept that war is over. They, they, it also means that there will not be any new war. So and they shouldn't be uh, 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 groups of people that think that there will be a rematch of this war, the, the Third Karabakh War or the Fourth Karabakh War. So the, we should look up to the more economic opportunities. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, this uh, uh, things about this uh, uh, the Armenian sovereign territories uh, also uh, this concern is coming also about this how demarcation uh, is happening in right now in international border areas. And there are some uh, uncertainties, some concerns of the local population. And I think it's based on the Soviet uh, Socialist Republic, uh, that the borders uh, uh, might be is happening very quickly, uh, not transparent. Uh, it might also uh, have also, it has an effect to the, uh, some populations, uh, the life. So that's why it uh, creates a much more concern, much more, let's say, disappointment by, by, by locals. But otherwise, I, I, I think, yes, the war is over, but also there is another retort that uh, they will not be in a status. Uh, but everyone understood that uh, if uh, for final negotiation solution, uh, so at least there will be some uh, clarity about, about this, uh, the status of Nagorno-Karabakh Armenians in, in Nagorno-Karabakh. So, but right now, the official position is that uh, no status and uh, we will continue this uh, issue, uh, this ne uh, negotiation. Uh, uh, but one thing is, uh, should be clear to everyone is that Azuris and Armenia often say that uh, people claim that they don't recognize each other, but I think they recognize each other's territorial integrity back to 1991, 21st of December in Almaty Declaration. So both Azovis and Armenia based on their Soviet territories. So. Oh, so I, I'll later ask Professor Libarizan mm -hmm. to comment on that question mm -hmm. that you just raised, but uh, uh, going back to uh, what you were saying uh, uh, quickly. so. If I understood you right, you're saying that this is simply a starting negotiating position, saying that there is no status, but in principle, you think it is still up to negotiation. So I think yes. Before, before Azovism position was most uh, Azovism presented its maximalist position on status, uh, offering that they will be high level status uh, to Nagorno Karabakh. But right now, I think the approach has changed. So right now, approach is that we are going to offer the minimalist approach. Minimalist approach is that uh, the cultural autonomy, which everyone also that is not going to be acceptable. Uh, so, and we will start uh, our uh, negotiation position on this, uh, the, the minimal approach, minimalist approach. First. Thank you. And do you see any other risks in the current developments that can contribute to this further escalation? I think yes, uh, there, there are many risks. The, the first risk is that there is a, a different interpretation of this, uh, the, the, the 9th of November ceasefire agreement, especially when it comes to the, uh, the fourth and the first uh, provision of uh, agreement, which I think this uh, also refers uh, to uh, uh, fourth article of this agreement as peacemaking, uh, peacekeeping force of Russian Federation shall be deployed in parallel with the visit of Armenian troops. So it, uh, as we can see, is that uh, all Armenian uh, troops or de facto authorities, they should uh, leave this uh, the region and only authority should be under the control of the, of the Russian troops. But uh, the Russian approach or the Armenian approach is that it, it should be interpreted based on this, the first article of this agreement, which says that everyone stays on the, uh, the, the actual position when this agreement is uh, coming to into force. Uh, so uh, this is this is one one uh, one issue. The second issue is that uh, uh, the question is that whether they will be a new uh, the lines, let's say line, uh, uh, they will be contact uh, lines of contact between Azerbaijanis and Armenians in in the Karabakh region, or there will be a chance of reintegration or. Uh, more uh, cooperation in this area, uh, area which is under the Russian uh, the, uh, the control zone. Uh, so, uh, uh, and based on that, I think there there, there will be many many small uh, questions about this electricity, uh, the, the the impact of humanitarian issues, uh, the, the uh, life of the, the local population, so the mining. So there are, there are many many uh, the small but very important issues that uh, affect uh, the local population life on both sides. Uh, thank you, Zahur. Uh, Professor Liparitan, let's turn to uh, Armenia. 
In the last two months, we've seen a great deal of internal instability uh, in Armenia. And on the one hand, we have uh, a pretty well organized opposition uh, led by the two uh, previous administrations of uh, Kocayan and Sarkisian, uh, and uh, parties aligned with them, such as Dashnaftitun currently, uh, who are demanding, uh, on the one hand, the resignation of the Pashinyan government, and uh, also seem to be standing on more revanchist positions vis-a-vis -vis Karabakh uh, or relations with Azerbaijan, at least in the longer term. And on the other hand, we have the current government that uh, seem to have lost a great deal of its initial legitimacy, both domestically and internationally. Um, and yet, uh, in practice, is refusing to consider, resign or call uh, new elections, while at the same time doesn't seem to be uh, able to negotiate on some uh, even key or simple or basic issues rather, such as return of prisoners of war. Uh, even yesterday we saw that there was a summit and that question was not resolved, uh, but also uh, keep control over uh, roads connecting the capital of Armenia Yerevan with the south and by extension in the longer term potentially uh, jeopardizing the viability of Armenia as a state. And these are just a few issues that uh, look like setting us up for further uh, instability and uh, escalation. Uh, the question to you uh, would be, do you see this as uh, challenges or what other risks you see in current developments? Uh, thank you, Phil. And thank you, Zaur. I would like to uh, specify uh, that I should have done earlier when I said Azerbaijan is not concerned uh, about people uh, I meant for the territory of Garapa and uh, basically for Armenians. And that's the issue. The issue is Armenians in Garapa and their relationship to Azerbaijan or Armenia. So um, I think to that, uh, in that sense, uh, my comment uh, would be largely correct. Uh, I would also add that the, uh, it's not just social media that is uh, making claims on Armenia. It is at the highest level of the Azerbaijani government. Uh, in terms of the direct negotiations uh, that Zaur mentioned and uh, Ms. Hussainova, I think we have a basic problem. That is, if the parties do not consider the problem to be theirs and they wait for others to find solutions, then uh, this is likely the outcome. That is, the others. Uh, also say, this is your problem, you have to resolve it. So we have not seen any aggressive proposals from the party since 97 uh, to solve their own problem. And that is uh, one of the issues. As far as the next war is concerned, I think it will not be a war for Garapa or, uh, or for Armenians there. It will be a war for the region. Uh, even if Garapa is the excuse to do it. So uh, it is beyond this conflict. Now, as far as the Armenian situ Armenia situation in Armenia is concerned, uh, I would say that um, there, there's obviously a disappointment uh, uh, with uh, the prime minister and his party and anger, of course, uh, but I do not believe that people see this opposition as the solution to the problem. Uh, they are very circumspect and they do not see how this group of opposition leaders who have been in power in the past and who have lost the elections can come back and solve any problem. So Armenia in, is in a very uh, serious uh, crisis, crisis of leadership, not so much one of constitution, although um, the opposition wants to bypass the constitution and uh, even the president is talking about a coalition government uh, and a coalition government would be much worse than uh, anything we've had because uh, what we need now is some wisdom and circumspection and not just unity for the sake of unity. Uh, so uh, let me go back for a second to the November 9 agreement or yesterday's statement. First of all, these two have to be taken together. We have to understand uh, one as the continuation of the other, a sub element of the first November 9 document. 
the first thing we know, it was mentioned already that uh, by Ms. Hussainova that uh, uh, the OSC wasn't there, number one. Number two, uh, it was not the military that were invited as it was the case in July to sign an agreement. It was the political leadership uh, to, that signed the ceasefire agreement and it was the political leadership that was invited to Moscow. Uh, but we have to realize that the November 9 statement is much more than a ceasefire agreement. It is less than a settlement, but it does settle two of the most important issues that were a problem and uh, for, for the resolution of the conflict. One is that the occupied territories have been taken back. They are returned. There's no more question as to whether they are negotiating chip or whatever. It's over. So that's a very, very important uh, element because this is one element that distinguished Karabakh conflict from, let's say, Abkhazia or South Ossetia or Transdniestra. Uh, that is the, uh, in those cases or Chechnya, the secessionist group, people, uh, state or unit did not go beyond their own borders that was defined during the Soviet Union except in this case. So that major issue was resolved in, in favor of Azerbaijan, yes, but still it was resolved. And the other is the statement implies the recognition by Armenia that everything that is internationally recognized as Azerbaijan is Azerbaijan. That's why President Aliyev can do his interpretation so these two uh, are, are very important. In terms of the uh, future status, we have to realize that that issue too has been narrowed down in terms of options. It is very clear, although it was clear that independence was almost uh, impossible before, that that is no longer on the table, independence for Garapal. And as many of you indicated, the question is now, whether the Armenians in Garapal will be recognized as an ethno-religious community that has the rights for culture, church, uh, school, and maybe other things, or will there be an administrative, political, territorially defined Armenian Garapal? This is, I think, where the negotiations uh, may, may uh, go. And I, I think this is a very important element. The November 9 agreement is a very, very flexible agreement. There are too many areas that are left undefined or not clearly defined. And sometimes that's constructive vagueness in international documents, because if you try to specify too much, then the other adage comes into play. That is, the devil is in the details. So you kind of fudge the details, get to the basic, and you get what you can from a document. And now with the meeting yesterday, we see that one of the issues that was critical for Azerbaijan, Turkey and Russia, that is the, the thing that was clarified most at first. For Armenia, it would have been the POWs, but that wasn't resolved. For Armenia, it might have been further clarification of whatever status may be left. That wasn't resolved. What was resolved, partially anyway, was the transportation routes, the connections. And uh, we see that that was a key to the resolution of the conflict, uh, the process. And uh, I, I think we, we need to be aware that the process has started. The peace process, whatever is left, has started. Uh, and this is the formula that will take place. The other issues will come gradually into play. And uh, the formula is Russia brings the two together, kind of tells them what is feasible. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, somehow it will find a solution and it will impose. The problem is that I do not think Armenia has the same leverage as it had before the war. It is very obvious. So. Uh, the process will be somewhat facilitated by that. The peace that will come is not to the liking of Armenians. It is not a fair peace. It may not be a just peace, but peace is not always a fair settlement. 
And this is what we're facing. Uh, my last point would be the following. Will Azerbaijan continue the rhetoric that is basically racist? Armenians are dogs, we will chase them like dogs. Will the Azerbaijani rhetoric and position continue to be one of domination rather than governance, which has been a problem? Azerbaijani rhetoric has given no reason for Armenians to trust that if they are a part of Azerbaijan, they will not be dominated rather than governed. So this is the question that is there for Azerbaijan. Will it be uh, a country that vanquished another people and it can do whatever it wants and humiliate, which is possible, it can do. That's what is happening so far. And that can also bring peace. Soviets brought peace for seven years. The question is that uh, on the one hand, I see two kinds of rhetoric in Azerbaijan. On the one, one hand is the international talk about economic development for the region. Now everything is resolved and we go and develop and Azerbaijan will be the economic driver of, of the region's development. And all Armenians have to do is accept some money, accept the terms and enjoy a, a new economic development. This is one. And the other is, that we will dominate you. We will not give you any chance to be anything other than what we decide you to be. And we can put claims on Armenia. These are the two realities with which we have to live. And Azerbaijan has to make a decision. Uh, uh, the Armenian side is not in a position to make many decisions. The Azerbaijani side is. If it wants a peace that is good for peoples, then it will have to change its rhetoric. It will have to change the way it talks and it behaves. And without that, yes, you can bring peace, you can dominate, you can win another war, or you may not need another war. Uh, the Turkey is there, Turkish troops are coming. So uh, that's not the question in my mind anyway. The question is whether Azerbaijan will behave in a way that eventually will be acceptable to Armenians, and then you have real peace, or it will behave in a way that leaves the Armenian side subdued, suppressed, but still unhappy. Now, that may or may not lead to another war, but that's not genuine peace in my mind. Thank you, uh, Professor Dibaritian. Yeah, pretty concerning, uh, frankly, and I do hope uh, we can see a change of rhetoric uh, rather soon. Uh, Sevil, uh, if I can turn to you, to, to, any comments on the risks do you see in the current situation or perhaps uh, any opportunities? Um, yeah, uh, can you hear me? No? Yeah, uh, thank you uh, for your uh, insights and thank you, Professor uh, Libarizian, for um, your comments. Um, yes, now what we are observing now, it's a kind of a peace, peace, peaceful enforcement, peace enforcement. Yeah, so, um, and uh, this is a moment when uh, we want to live in peace, but it's it mean it mean it, it comes uh, from not uh, from the uh, peaceful meanings, but with the means of uh, enforcement. And um, um, and there are lots of of course there are lots of uh, other uh, risks which uh, we uh, didn't uh, touch upon. Um, but the biggest risk risk what what I, what I uh, observe that we are on. on we are once again in a situation of mutual misunderstanding of speaking different languages about the same situation. Um, and let's uh, talk about the prospects, about uh, the opportunities, what can be done to restart an effective peace process. Um, and I uh, ask uh, Mr. Sharif, uh, uh, what do you think, what can or should Azerbaijan do um, to restart an effective peace process. Uh, thank you, uh, Seville. I, I, I think the first of all, I think uh, we should have a, the, the national dialogue. I mean, uh, which what, what, what lacks right now 
as as you mentioned, as you say that this is a misunderstanding between Azerbaijanis and Armenians, but uh, this is not only the lack of understanding. Also, this is a, I, I think that the, there is no genuine talks between Azerbaijanis and Armenians. Uh, so, but before the all talks or all con, uh, communication between Azerbaijanis and Ar Armenians based on this, a very small group of groups of people, based on expert level or based on the, the civil society groups, but uh, there weren't any uh, national dialogue or the discussion between Azerbaijanis and Armenians. Even the 19th, uh, after the war, there was a, some uh, some com better communication uh, between the media, between this uh, the population in a large, which uh, uh, they they heard, they, they have, they communicated, they understand the other side, the, the position. So this also creates an empathy between the sides to understand other sides' position, other sides', the sides feelings, other sides, uh, the, Disappointment or the wish. So there should be first of all the the the, the national dialogue between Azerbaijanis and Armenians. Might be it seems very earlier to talk about it, but uh, in, <clears throat> eventually I think uh, this should be a part of this uh, the dialogue, uh, the broader uh, broader dialogue between Azerbaijanis and Armenians first. The second issue is much more important is that uh, you know that uh, denied or the silence past is likely to lead uh, to similar conflict, <clears throat> especially where the former victims or survivors feel unheard and uncompensated. So when the, when the war ends with negotiated solution, uh, always, always the, the, uh, there will be a mechanism to address the past human rights, abuse and violation of, of international humanitarian law. law. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, especially uh, the, since the first world, uh, there weren't any any commission, any let's say the platform to discuss and to tackle this issue, uh, the human rights violation and the war crimes and other things. Not only about this uh, the the recent war, but also the war, the first uh, first war, uh, first Nagorno Karabakh war. So first, uh, so there should be. Uh, as, as they created this transport commission, there should be also some commission of the peace commission or, or the commission that to look up or uh, to look to this uh, the, the issue. The third issue is the, about, about the transport corridors. I, I, I agree that uh, the right now as a reason approach is that transport corridors uh, will bring the much more opportunities for both Azerbaijanis and, and Armenia. And this, this is a an idea, regionalization of these countries. So uh, regionalization will bring uh, uh, much more prospect and uh, economic uh, prosperity to the population, but this is a long-term project. Uh, so uh, we will not feel immediately, unlike the uh, 19, 19th, uh, when the first war ended, uh, there were some, uh, let's say the communication uh, or coexistence of Azerbaijan and Armenians living together. So that's why that time this sound better to population that having uh, much more economic prosperity, regional integration. But right now after 30 years of uh, disintegration of Azerbaijan and Armenians, it sounds uh, less attractive and less possible. But eventually I will, I will say that yes, uh, these uh, transport corridors, uh, opening borders, economic, prosper uh, 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 economic prospect could bring the much more the um, uh, possibility of uh, re-engagement of Azerbaijan and Armenians. Uh, <clears throat> another, another issue uh, might be is the humanitarian approach. So there should be much more broader focus. Uh, as Professor Libardian uh, mentioned about this uh, lack of, or uh, the 19th uh, November agreement, uh, so there are some uh, article about this uh, involvement of the UN relevant agencies for humanitarian work. We don't see yet about uh, this issue. The, this only we see uh, Russian monopolization of the humanitarian affairs. So uh, there is need uh, urgently a much more international focus, international engagement uh, to these humanitarian uh, the affairs. So actually, uh, if you talk about this peace process, how it's going to look like, so we can uh, we can we can talk about the short term expectation, long term expectation. But I do agree that yes, rhetoric should change in both uh, the countries. So rhetoric shouldn't be about the revanchism or about this uh, one side win and other side loss. So this uh, this versatile like. Uh, um, 
perception or the attitude is not going to help. Um, thank you, Zaur. Um, think about uh, short term um, steps. Um, uh, I would add that there are uh, lots of um, um, problems, challenges, which uh, we should uh, address urgently. They are humanitarian problems. Um, the war prisoners, the uh, resettle resettlement of IDP. So there are lots of um, short term um, problems which uh, should be uh, addressed right now. Um, and uh, Professor, um, um, my question to you, the same question um, about the um, prospects uh, and um, about what Armenia can do or should do uh, for to restart the peace uh, process. Thank you. The first thing is uh, not to have a government uh, <clears throat> that uh, does not understand what the November 9 document means. Uh, that uh, returns to the mentality that was there before, that was based on a total lack of appreciation of uh, power relations. That is what you can do and what you cannot do. Uh, not only in terms of what you, resources you have, let's say in the military field, in and by itself, but compared to what your antagonist has. So we need to think our, our uh, mentality to begin with and make sure that uh, we don't bring a government that uh, starts thinking of another war. Uh, whatever must be done, must be done through negotiations, I think. Uh, I agree with Zaur on the need for a broader dialogue. And I think that dialogue can become possible uh, if uh, the rhetoric is changed in Azerbaijan. The, uh, we should remember that it was uh, the Azerbaijani government that put an end to journalists' visits and various groups that were working together on the social level. Now, uh, uh, the question of uh, the transport corridors, economic development is uh, also a point on which I agree with uh, you and Zaur and others. But the question is, when does that become uh, real? <clears throat> and which comes first? Is it the change in rhetoric and uh, the adoption of a new rhetoric that brings cooperation? Or is it uh, the rhetoric of imposition? Uh, as far as the international involvement of human on, in humanitarian affairs, yes, uh, certainly. Uh, the UN should be involved, and uh, uh, that that is a question now that will be uh, that must be worked out between Russia and the UN agencies, as well as Azerbaijan and UN ag agencies. Um, so uh, the possibilities of development are there, but we must begin by deciding whether uh, we want to be neighbors or conqueror and, and uh, subdued nation. Uh, this is uh, where we are. And the, it will require quite a bit of wisdom and circumspection and ingenuity on the part of uh, the Armenian side to work with Azerbaijan. And I do favor uh, the always favored, the direct discussions. Uh, the international community should be there to support, but I do not think that with the intention of solving problems, uh, there could be better solutions than those that the two parties most directly involved can find. So the whatever process is taking place should continue at another level as well, directly between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Not to contradict, uh, the Russian uh, process, but to complement it. That is the recognition that this is our problem. This is the problem of Azerbaijan, this is the problem of Armenia and Armenians. So uh, if we are, if we, if we expect to live together in the future, we must start talking together now. Otherwise, uh, the future will not come. So uh, in general, I agree with the, with the comments.
Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, maybe this is the right uh, time to start uh, talking to each other. And a few, maybe um, you have, can uh, you uh, have something to add. Uh, thank you. I think just for the interest of time, though, I'll want to turn to the Q&A session because a lot of uh, very interesting comments are uh, coming in. So, uh, and they are very much in line with what we are hearing. Uh, but yes, a quick comment to um, about what the uh, about the question of future cooperation. Uh, certainly, I agree with Professor Diparitian that there have been many roadblocks put to direct communication uh, from Azerbaijan. But in my experience, uh, there have been also many roadblocks put to cooperation uh, from the Armenian end as well, including on the question of uh, exchange in the last couple of years, uh, at least our organization made many attempts and was continually blocked from the Armenian side of uh, organizing any kind of not directly government control exchanges between journalists or experts uh, and so on. So yes, by all means, I understand and agree that the uh, ball is in the end of Azerbaijani health and they have to start uh, extending a hand and uh, engaging in direct communication and more constructive communication with Armenia and Armenians. Uh, but I also hope that we'll see a change also on the Armenian side and uh, there will also uh, be more openness towards uh, communication, direct communication and dialogue with the Azerbaijani side. Uh, and this brings us, us to the question that uh, came in a few different forms from the audience uh, about uh, kind of this double-edged question. It's about the incentives for the sides to engage in this dialogue. Uh, and uh, the kind of second part of a question is, if there is, what can this uh, new peace document look like? Yeah, so that, because that can potentially be an incentive. So we have the November 9th statement, which as uh, you both mentioned, resolves some uh, of the uh, big issues, fair and fair, it's a different conversation, but it clearly uh, moved the conflict into a very new place. So if they are to negotiate uh, what can, uh, be in this new, yeah, uh, some other principles are out the window now, essentially, they are not relevant anymore. What is it that's new uh, content for negotiations? But second part of the question is what are the incentives, either for the governments or for the societies to engage with each other at this stage? And perhaps, uh, yeah, Professor Biparitian, you can comment on um, Armenia. Let's say Azerbaijan makes its step. Uh, yeah, what are the incentives for Armenians? Uh, who perceive largely this current situation as unjust, what are their incentives to engage? And uh, then I'll follow up with a similar question to Zaur. So, uh, you are muted. Uh, when I think about these issues, uh, I always think in terms of all the parties concerned in terms of what is feasible uh, and what works for the future. And it's relatively simple. The answer of the incentive, uh, there's a big answer and there's a small answer. The big answer is that if you have leadership in these countries that wants a future that is dignified for their peoples, a future that is peaceful for their peoples and that makes it possible for individuals and groups to live in peace and in some kind of hope for some kind of uh, economic security other than military, etc. then that's the incentive for peace. That's the incentive to sit and resolve the issues. That is, the governments of these countries must decide what issues are they resolving when they are deciding on conflict resolution. Are they resolving partisan issues? Are they resolving their sense of pride? Are they resolving their sense of uh, uh, a big past glorious history that must return? Or are they thinking about today? This is the big question. If you ask the right question, the right answer there is not difficult. And the second thing is that the more uh, you come close to a peace agreement, to a process of resolving your problems, 
the more assistance you will get from the international community and the more you are in charge of your own sovereignty and future. I, I think these are not easy, but these are important and critical incentives. Um, thank you. I mean, it, I've been also uh, thinking that the very sovereignty, uh, perhaps initially of Armenia, but uh, these are dominoes that fall one after another. As we've seen from history, the sovereignty of one part of Caucasus is gone that probably will trigger um, the chain reaction also in Georgia and Azerbaijan. So uh, I do hope that we can start looking at it from the bigger perspective. Uh, but uh, the second part of the question was, uh, and perhaps you touched a bit upon it in the previous uh, comment, but if you have anything to add, what is it that if they, let's say, agree to and decide to sit and negotiate in a good faith, what is it that this new uh, negotiation document but can be about? I, yeah. uh, I, I don't think I have much to add. I think I, it's still, there are some open areas uh, where uh, elements could still be negotiated, uh, but I, I don't think it's, it's uh, the right time at this point to say this is what it should look like. Fair enough, uh, thank you. And Zaur, if I can uh, turn to you, well, what's your thinking about uh, either existing incentives in Azerbaijan or what that could be uh, moving forward to engage in a good faith in a constructive process? Uh, I think it's, uh, it's too early, I mean, the, to put forward any ideas that what, what will be the, the main principle of negotiation, the future negotiation and when there will be such negotiation between the parties. But uh, I think uh, based on the concern of Azerbaijan, I think their main motivation right now to uh, so to to rebuilding of the, uh, the territories uh, and uh, the mining and other issues and return of uh, the IDPs. So it's a longer term process for Baku also, and it, it needs a much more investment, much more the energy is going to this uh, the particular issue. I think so that's why in based on the uh, priorities, I think the first priority is, uh, is to rebuilding of uh, the cities uh, and, uh, uh, and basic infrastructure and, uh, and employment and then returning the identities to their homes. So this is the main energy of the government and the government is, 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 is going to, to this direction. But this, at the same time, there is some issues that, uh, uh, let's say, the small issues might be, for example, roads connectivity. So there is no uh, proper roads that are connect other region uh, from, let's say, uh, between the Kalbazan and another region proper, which they should use this, uh, the, uh, the, the territory is, uh, is under uh, the, the Russian the, uh, control. Uh, so the same is true about this uh, lesson uh, uh, from Latsun to to Kalbazar and and uh, and all from Shusha to the Azerbaijan proper. So there are uh, so this uh, the small issues, uh, but uh, this is uh, how they are going to resolve. So then about this electricity, uh, water supply, and other things that is uh, the uh, the concern of the local population. Uh, so this kind of the small things uh, that they should start first of all to. Uh, I mean, in order to uh, to move forward uh, and to satisfy their their their, their local uh, population. But uh, the second issue, most more important for right now, as a region, is that to negotiate of this mandate of the Russian peacekeepers and how it's going to look like. We we have uh, as a region and Armenia gave the mandate to Russia to conduct the peacekeeping forces, but the, the provision and act of duty and other things are unclear, especially this is a great concern of Baku. So that's why the, the, this is also the, the main cons, uh, main priority for Baku, but they're going to negotiate this with Russia. So a lot of things I think right now, at least in the, in the short term, Azerbaijan is going to negotiate with Russia rather than Armenia. Uh, especially when it comes to the peacekeeping forces and uh, the control of the, the so-called Latin corridor and, uh, and other things. But also the time will come, they should negotiate something that's uh, mutually interesting of the local Armenian population and other region is in the Golf Club region, which then, then the, they will need their counterparts uh, that uh, have a much more open open to dialogue and uh, ready to, 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 to 
to congregation. So when it comes, uh, when it's going to come and uh, and what will happen then, it's, it's unclear to me for now, but uh, it, this this is a very short-term concern. So it should happen very immediately in the next couple of months. Uh, but in the longer term as a peace process, it's hard to say right now that what they're going to negotiate. Thank you. Sabir, do, <clears throat> do you have a question from the audience that you would like to bring up? Yes, we have uh, lots of questions. Um, I'll try to uh, specific uh, questions as well. Um, um, I have a question to both Liberadian and Sharif. After Second Karabakh War, um, do you see any opportunities for the negotiations on the level of civil societies of Armenia and Azerbaijan in favor, favor of the straightening of peace process? Do you think that leaders of Armenia and Azerbaijan should again focus on preparing population for peace? Do you think that preparing population for peace is one of important steps leading up to permanent peace and stability in the region? Uh, Professor? Well, I, I think uh, we have answered, at least I have answered, uh, of course, the government should prepare uh, their people uh, for, uh, for peace. Uh, as I said, two of the main issues seem to be resolved. Uh, and all of the issues that Zaur mentioned are, of course, relevant, still to be resolved. Some of these are issues to be resolved within uh, Azerbaijan uh, and uh, others within Armenia. Uh, but uh, uh, it is essential that governments agree to things that do not, uh, that respect the dignity of peoples. This is very important, that whatever is done in the process, permanent peace will depend on whether it is an honorable peace or not, whether it takes into consideration the fundamental interests of uh, the two countries and the peoples involved. Uh, this is for me uh, the key to future peace. Otherwise it will be an imposed peace and it will not uh, produce even the, the best uh, results economically. I muted. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Professor. Um, Mr. Sharif, do you want to add something to this question? Uh, yes, the first question about the role of the civil society groups. I think we don't. Uh, so, yeah, before, uh, at least in the two, two decades, we saw that civil society engagement with civil society, not with their population. So, this was the main problem. Armenian civil society engaged with Azerbaijan civil society. Uh, so, but uh, the, the main lack was that uh, they, they didn't engage with their own societies. So uh, this has uh, some objective and subjective reasons why this uh, the, this not happened. But right now, is it the right time to engage with other within our main and civil societies? Uh, probably yes, uh, but uh, but this should be, uh, the visibility should be uh, there. So before there was a lack of the visibility uh, for obvious reasons that uh, this can uh, create a, suspect, a disappointment or people treat them uh, differently. So right now might be they have a much more chance to, to be much more visible. Uh, so on particular in other words, and I think there's uh, some, there is a, there is a some, uh, uh, there is need much more transparency. Uh, and also more support to civil society, especially uh, uh, the donor organization to get a donor uh, from from abroad uh, for this peace process. Uh, so this is a uh, this was a main problem for civil societies uh, uh, to be active in Azerbaijan. So uh, the, uh, another question about the how to, the preparation population for peace. Uh, so before. Before the war, it was understood that uh, we should prepare population to the possible compromise. At least this was my understanding is that uh, the preparation population for peace uh, meant before that uh, preparation of them to, uh, to 
some compromise, but right now, preparation for, uh, publishing for peace should be uh, uh, to uh, to give t uh, them a chance or understanding that they should uh, live uh, side by side in the future. So they should be coexistence and there should be some uh, trade and discussion and dialogue between this, uh, the individuals from, uh, from both countries. So who should do this? I think the government is, is not uh, the main, uh, my, everyone is expecting from the governments to do this. Uh, I'm not sure about this, that the government uh, to tell the civil society to engage and prepare population for peace. Yes, for what depends from governments uh, to rhetoric, how they are setting up their rhetoric. So this will help uh, other actors, whether this is civil society, individuals, journalists, media, uh, they will follow the their uh, level of rhetoric. So first of all, this is expected from government. Uh, and the other issues about this technical uh, and other issues is dependent mostly to civil society, but they should be very conductive. Uh, they, they should be very uh, environment for them to conduct this operation and this society tractor process. Thank you. Thank you, Zaur. And um, uh, Phil? Yeah, we have many questions uh, connected to the uh, role of Russia. And let me try to see how we can summarize uh, the questions. So one cluster of questions is about uh, something like this. So the situation has changed and Karabakh was unique as Professor Liparitan mentioned in a sense that uh, it controlled more territories that uh, it's uh, Soviet autonomous borders. Uh, it was also unique uh, in a different way that uh, the only, it was the only, only conflict that did not have direct Russian involvement in the post-Soviet space. So it was pretty much uh, between um, the Armenians and the Azerbaijanis uh, to be able to resolve. Uh, of course, with uh, the support of uh, other actors uh, in the first place, uh, first of all, Russia, but they still had this direct communication agency uh, over uh, these territories. So that has changed. And in that sense, the conflict starts looking much more like South Ossetia uh, than Nagorno-Karabakh of two months ago. Uh, so there is Russian peacekeepers. The conflict is contained to the uh, part of the former uh, Soviet autonomy. Uh, so how far should we take this analogy? Yeah? So if uh, what we saw is happening in South Ossetia uh, and as well as uh, Crimea uh, and Trans Transnistria and so on, uh, so Sooner or later, that seems to bring uh, into towards the conflict between then Russia, uh, who had peace, peacekeepers on the ground, uh, and the state, the, the other kind of the mother state within which the autonomy uh, was located. In this case, there would be Azerbaijan. So, does do we see then a potential for conflict between Russia and Azerbaijan uh, down the road if uh, the trend continues and if it starts looking like South Ossetia? The flip side of the question or the other side of the coin is what does it mean for Armenia? Yeah, if we again build on the South Ossetia or Abkhazia um, analogy, essentially they don't, they uh, might be partially recognized, but uh, they also clearly have very limited uh, control or sovereignty over their own territory. So that certainly applies currently to Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, can this also transfer to Armenia? Essentially, what is the prospect of concerning role of Russia, let's say, in terms of its contribution to conflict, its own involvement uh, in a violent conflict, but also what can be the positive role uh, of Russia and how we can uh, work towards maximizing the positive potential, since Russians clearly played a very positive role in terms of stopping the conflict and helping us uh, negotiate ceasefire agreements, not once, but already twice, or actually we include 2016 also three times. So any comments from Professor Libaritsen? Let's start from you. Well, the Russian role is what uh, Azerbaijan and Russia will decide essentially, but let's not forget the Turkey factor, which we haven't discussed so far. It's a major, uh, major element that was added, not that it was inactive before, but now it is much more of an active a role because it has become uh, not only a partner, but also uh, maybe a driver in Azerbaijani policy. So uh, we have a document, uh, the November 9, that says five years. And uh, 
if everything goes well, then at the end of five years or before, six months before, Azerbaijan will have to decide whether it wants Russian troops there. So that's technically the, uh, the uh, legal, so to speak, part. That is the obligations that parties have toward the document of November 9. Uh, whether so it it is possible that Azerbaijan may decide that it no longer wants um, to have Russian troops on its territory. And uh, that also depends, I think, to some extent on Turkey. So uh, Russia has achieved something with this, uh, has sealed something rather uh, with this statement and with this intervention. Uh, that it has wanted to do for a long time, that's to leave out the West. And in order to do that, it brought in Turkey, not only to win the war, but also uh, as, as a, uh, to replace US presence, let's say, uh, diplomatically and otherwise. Uh, so, um, it's not clear to me, what is Russia's end game? I don't know, maybe others do it, but I'm afraid that often uh, it's a reflexive reaction to Russia. Uh, you know, uh, I know that for many years in Azerbaijan, they explained the loss of the first war uh, because Russia did it for Armenia. Uh, th these are quite simplistic explanations. Uh, also explanations that say Russia is trying to do this or that. Well, obviously, Russia wants to have uh, more uh, control uh, over the general trend in the South Caucasus and less of uh, direction toward uh, US or NATO. So, uh, and Turkey is not acting as NATO, Turkey is acting as Turkey. Uh, so we have a, a very uncertain, in my mind anyway, as to where Azerbaijan wants to go, where Turkey wants to be in five years. Uh, maybe it, Azerbaijan will tell Russia to leave and then you know that creates a brand new situation or uh, Russia uh, can find that, it's, that it cannot leave because if it does, then there will be more instability in the region and then they will have to decide whether they go to war or not. That would be Azerbaijan plus Turkey against Russia. So uh, in my mind, uh, there are too many questions left. Uh, Professor Libaitsan, just to build on uh, where you ended though. So uh, thank you for discussing the Russia's role and I so certainly agree with you that Russia achieved the big objective of pushing out uh, the West uh, from uh, this region. Uh, but we do have uh, quite a few members um, in the audience from representing the Western institutions, uh, the, particularly European Union and many others. Uh, how do you see in the current situation the involvement uh, of the Western actors, either uh, European Union or United States or a combination of them, so how they can be the most uh, effective uh, in influencing the situation in a positive sense? Well, uh... They have a role to play uh, in a number of areas. Uh, that is to the extent that um, uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia have some dependence on Europe, whether diplomatic, uh, economic or otherwise, uh, they have a role to play, but they do not have the essential role to play. I think in terms of the conflict itself and how it proceeds, it will be largely Russia and Turkey and Azerbaijan and uh, to a lesser extent, Armenia, and maybe also Iran. Uh, and for the future in general, these are the countries that will be important. The others can influence specific issues maybe. Uh, they can uh, participate in the development, uh, whether it's rebuilding. Uh, it, many European companies, maybe American companies will be uh, signing contracts or have, have signed contracts. Uh, but in terms of the political issue, uh, I don't think they will play a major role. Let me say something about the, um, the question of principles, OSCE or otherwise, of international law. Uh, 
in the name of which many have spoken, and the parties have often used this uh, in order to justify their uh, negotiation position. Uh, I do not have much trust in international principles. Uh, international law and principles are made by big governments, big countries, for big countries. And they decide where these apply and when. Uh, history is full of this. I do not think principles are that important for Azerbaijan because Azerbaijan picked one of the principles and left the others in terms of uh, what is important. Azerbaijan said territorial integrity is important. And even by OSCE or UN principles, you have the principle of self-determination. You have the principle of peaceful resolution of conflicts, which Azerbaijan rejected from the first moment uh, in 1991. Uh, so uh, there, there are many OSC principles, you know, that were disregarded other than self-determination were two, peaceful resolution of conflicts. And secondly, that all these principles must be taken together and not separately. The Armenian side took the self-determination issue and suspended the territory integrity issue for whatever reason. Uh, so to the extent that the European Union and the US or UN represent international law, I personally do not have much trust in it. So uh, what they can do is impact specific issues impact reconstruction, impact uh, some of the values that are still important and practiced in Europe, not so much in the US anymore. So, uh, you know, those are the areas where they can be helpful. Thank you, uh, the pessimistic view, and I do hope we can see a change in the US and by extension, uh, some you know, more respect towards the principles of international law, not for the sake of our region, but uh, the rest of the world as well. Uh, Zaur? Uh, your, your take on Russia and Turkey and uh, other international yeah, I think uh, uh, the Russian role, uh, so sometimes we under, undermine or uh, exaggerate the Russian role, our expectation from Russia, but uh, from the, I mean, the last three, four years, at least it was very clear that uh, uh, in, in any kind of the peace process or any final things, the Russia will have some role, some kind of role. Uh, unlike we, we 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 wish for for much more with with an engagement in 19th uh, less Russian role, uh, so but it was very clear that even this the Lavrov plan uh, there was a provision about the deployment of the Russian peacekeepers forces. So what is different right now? Unlike the 2016, right there is a uh, the role of the Turkey. Turkey is a security guarantor and also the balancing actor in the region. So and also this uh, right now they are mutually with Russia uh, observing this ceasefire uh, violation. Uh, things uh, uh, in Karabakh. Uh, so this is the one uh, the change that there is a counterbalancing of the, uh, the Turkey. The second is that the narrative. We, we, our understanding about Russia, when I say the our, I mean Azerbaijan is based on this narrative, historical narrative about the Russian role. Uh, in the longer term, in the 200 years, or in this, uh, the time that when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, so, but we, we we saw many faces of the Russia. So, if you if you look to the 1992, early 1992, you can say that Russia is a much more supportive of Azerbaijan. Or end of the 1992, Russia is supporting more Armenia. So, there is a different interpretation of the Russian role. So, there are there are many disappointments in Azerbaijan society. At least, uh, I mean, there is no data that I would say that Azerbaijan society. At least, based on the social media observation, that Russia involvement in the in the in the conflict uh, and deployment of the Russian troops, and everyone is uh, say based on the fact that Russia left uh, the country after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So this was the biggest achievement of the government. But at the same time, we always uh, forgot that Russian troops was in Azerbaijan until 2012 uh, at the Gabala radar station. So we. We always say that is an analytical exchange center, but it was actually part of the kind of the military base of Russia in Azerbaijan. So that's why we used to live uh, at least uh, how to cooperate with, with Russia. But right now, the how um, Russian role is uh, is much more bilateral issue between Baku and Azerbaijan. Uh, so more urgent question is that what will be uh, they are. Uh, the mandate will look like. So right now, uh, uh, probably they are going to negotiate with Baku that uh, 
both Bakus is, is feasible, both Bakus is not feasible, and this will be uh, part of the negotiation. So in, in, in any given time, if there will be a final solution in a, let's say, final piece, uh, uh, there's no doubt that Russia will have a special place in, 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 in this agreement. Either Russia will be a guarantor of the peace agreement or Russia will have a, some troops left to the region. So it's too early to talk about it, what Russian uh, uh, role will look like. But right now, I think uh, it's, it's, it, it, it seems that Azerbaijan is negotiating and Azerbaijan has a trust that they can cooperate with Russia. So without uh, making angry the Russian authorities. So, uh, but what about this, uh, what others can contribute? I think the part of the equation was, uh, I mean, everyone should check the, uh, uh, Type the, in the Google that Minsk Group, and they will find that official uh, the website which says that Minsk Group uh, mandate. So it says that uh, we can see Minsk Group successful if they uh, met two objectives. One is this uh, conducting uh, this uh, the Minsk conference, which has not happened. Second is that multinational peacekeeping forces. So so that's why when we say that Minsk Group failed, we, uh, we are saying based on this uh, what they wrote. Uh, what they put uh, for them as, a, as an objective. So there's a less chance that uh, the outside powers uh, can have a much more substantial role in, in the security provision of this, uh, on this issue, but there's a chance that broader Minsk group, Minsk group can play a much more role. This broader Minsk group is uh, including OIC Troika, other permit members of the Minsk group. So, but the question is that how, uh, one can use the potential of this uh, members, uh, permanent member states. This includes also Germany, I mean, the Belarus, Turkey, and other countries. So, and how and how and when they can uh, play a role in this uh, issue. Thank you, Mr. Shirir. Thank you, Professor Liparitian. We are uh, approaching the end uh, of uh, our webinar today. I uh, very much appreciate uh, all, all the insights. I want to acknowledge that uh, we have over 60 more questions that we could not address. A lot of them were uh, they're focused on geopolitics. Uh, and that is actually the topic of our next uh, webinar that will take place in um, February, specifically on uh, February 16 at the same time uh, as this one. Uh, if I can ask my colleagues to uh, post a link in the chat window uh, to the next seminar, uh, that would be appreciated. So we'll, thank you. Uh, so you can see the link uh, in the chat window, everyone. So please consider uh, registering to that one. You can also see the names of our four panelists uh, from Russia, Turkey, uh, as well as covering the EU angle. Uh, and uh, the question there was also about the goals of this series of webinars. Uh, some saying that conflict is over, some saying there is nothing to talk about. So it's a really good question. Uh, and our goal uh, here is to uh, we call our series the new war and peace, uh, meaning that we have a new situation uh, on the ground and it's not clear yet whether we are going towards a new war or towards a new peace or some combination of two, uh, which was really what we had for nearly 30 years now where we had some elements of peace and some elements of war. So it can be very much war and peace in the same place. And we hope with this series of uh, webinars, uh, first to start a dialogue among the experts uh, who from Armenian side and Azerbaijani side, but also from the broader region uh, and move the conversation hopefully in a direction that can contribute to uh, the prevalence of peace rather than uh, war down the road. So this is our goal. Again, we hope to see uh, more of you or many of you uh, in a month uh, as well. And I would want to also stress which, that we have a recording of this um, a, a webinar and we will be posting it on our social media account, our websites, uh, either fully or maybe a bit of a shorter version to make it easier to watch. And we also are planning uh, to provide a short written summary uh, in English, but also in Armenian and Azerbaijani to reach a broader audience. So once again, thank you very much everyone for joining us and hopefully we'll see you in a month. Thank you.